Hello and welcome to my guide on the setup and different configurations of the Mini DSP 2x4 HD. This guide will also apply to the 4x10 and other Mini DSP models, but some features might be different and you may have more flexibility with other models of the Mini DSP line. All the software I will be using in this video is on a Windows 10 uh, system, but Mini DSP has a guide online on different ways you can do the same thing on Mac OS based systems. I will be covering crossover, EQ, and how to integrate the Mini DSP into many, many different types of systems, uh, integrated amplifiers, receivers, separate systems, basically everything you can think of. Um, so yeah, thank you for watching this video and let's get started. So the first configuration option we're going to go over is the Mini DSP in a separate system. Now for those who don't know, a separate system is when you have a separate preamplifier which controls the volume and input selection and then you have a power amplifier uh, which does the main amplification. Now the power amplifier has no volume control options. It might have gain options but those are at a fixed level. You don't change them. Um, so integrating a mini DSP into a separate system is by far the easiest way to use a mini DSP. It provides the most flexibility, the most options by far. Um, so let's go over all the different things you can do with a mini DSP in a separate system. Now the way you'd uh, put a mini DSP into a separate system is you have the two channel outputs from your preamp. Now my Emotiva XDA2 here is operating as the preamp. And you'd have that go into the analog inputs of the uh, mini DSP. Now I am doing this over a hard bridge connector but you can do this over an RCA cable. Uh, it, it's essentially the same thing. Then you have the processing in the mini DSP. You send your uh, main signal, your full range signal to your amplifier and you'd send your subwoofer signal to your subwoofers. Now if you don't run subwoofers, you just disregard the subwoofer um, channels. You just run them straight into the uh, main amp. Or if you have, you know, if you happen to not be running subwoofers and you have two extra outputs, you could try to uh, remove the crossover, the physical crossovers from your speakers and do a, uh, a digital crossover with a four channel or two stereo power amps. Now, that is just one of the many possibilities you can use in a separate system. You can use it for crossover between uh, a tweeter and a woofer, a speaker and a subwoofer, etc. You can use it to EQ both of these channels and you don't have to worry about any volume issues because, again, all the volume all the you know, levels are being controlled before the crossover. So the uh, main speakers and the subwoofers were always, once you set the match to levels, they will always be matched. They won't ever become unmatched. Uh, this is an issue with, you know, if you're trying to use an integrated amplifier, um, or if, you, if you're running this into an integrated, if you use a mini DSP before the integrated, and you use the mini DSP after a, a source, then your subwoofers and your speakers will never be matched because the integrated will be controlling the volume. So the subwoofers will always get the full range signal. Now I'll talk more about this when we move on to the integrated section, but for a separate system, it's very, very simple and it offers a lot of flexibility in terms of how you can use the mini DSP. Again, I'm going to go over uh, the software and uh, specifically how I'm using it later, but overall, a separate system is the way to go if you can do it. Again, you can always use a integrated, but a separate system is the easiest way to do it. Say hello to the Proton D940 receiver integrated amplifier. Um, this is a integrated, essentially. It's an NAD 7040 PE that was rebranded by Proton and a upgraded power supply section was installed. So, you might be thinking, okay, this is an integrated amp. Now, I won't be able to uh, use all of the extra features that you might be able to have with a separate system. Well, uh, let's take a look at the back. So, this amplifier has what's called a pre-out main in. And now what that is, is when you remove these jumpers, it essentially converts this amplifier into a separate system. It separates the pre-out, which is the pre-amplifier section, to the main in, which is the power amplifier section. So, putting a mini DSP between these two is very easy. You simply take the pre-out, put it into the input of the mini DSP, take the output of the mini DSP, or you know, the full range output of the mini DSP, and send it into the main in. Now this allows you to DSP, you know, an EQ, crossover, whatever you want, to what is, would be drived by the speaker terminals of this amp. And it also lets you EQ, crossover, um, whatever you want, to the subwoofers, because what, become, what comes before 
the DSP is a volume variable source, meaning that the level of the subs and the level or the level of you know whatever else you're driving and the level of the primary output, so these terminals, once they're set, they will stay set, so they won't be variable. Um, they won't you know get offset from each other. Now this is a super useful feature. And many older amps, a lot of them from NAD, a lot of Proton, a lot of NAD amplifiers have this feature. And some modern amplifiers, like lots of the new NAD stuff, has this feature as well. So what you're going to want to do is, if you already have it integrated, and you're thinking about buying a mini DSP, you will definitely want to check to make sure that your amp has some sort of pre-out main in uh, before you purchase it, uh, so you don't get you know surprised, oh, I can't do this, oh, I can't do this. Uh, so you're going to want to make sure and some amps are called something different. They're called like preamplifier out, preamp out, power amp in, power in, uh, you know, main power amp in. But it's it's the same. It's the same functional thing. You'll also want to make sure you don't get confused between the pre out and the tape out. A tape out is a fixed level source, so it's not controlled by the volume knob on the amp. And if you try to run a tape out into a main in, you're most likely going to blow something up because you're going to be running a line level signal into the power amp section. That's not good. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty much uh, what you can do with some of these amps. These amps are now very rare, uh, the ones that have the pre-out main in, and uh, it's a very useful feature. So if you already have an amp, make sure it has this before you purchase the Mini DSP. Next, we're going to talk about amplifiers that don't have a pre-out main in loop and the types of things you can do with them. So this is the last stereo amp I will be talking about. This is the Primer A20. This is an early 90s uh, late 2000s amp, I think. It's an integrated from Primary. It's a digital amp. So we will be talking about, it's not a class D, it is a class A amplifier, but it is a digitally controlled. So we are going to be talking about this amp, how you can integrate a mini DSP into this. Now, this is the first amplifier I will be talking about that has some sort of restrictions on what you can do with a mini DSP. Let's take a look at the back. So as you can see here, we have our speaker outputs, and then we have our pre-out. Now you might be, okay, yeah, I remember the pre-out from the uh, Proton, but where's the main in? That's the point. There is no main in on this amplifier. Now, what you can do with this, a pre-out is commonly used. You simply take the outputs, send them to subwoofers or subwoofer, and then uh, the pre-out is controlled with the volume knob and the speaker outputs just send to the speakers, and then you have you know, a subwoofer integration. No, that's great, but that doesn't allow you to DSP. Now, what you can do with the mini DSP is just put the mini DSP after the pre-outs, but because there is no main in, you will not be able to equalize the things that are connected to the speaker outputs here. You will not be able to affect these in any way with the settings you put into the mini DSP, because there is no way to send this out and have it go back in to the power amplifier section. Now, what you can do with this is equalize subwoofers. That's that's the only thing you can do if you continue to want to use the amplifier section of this amp. Now, the way Primary intended for the pre-out to be used is if you wanted to upgrade the power amp section of this amp by using an external power amp like my Adcom or like Primary's own you know, power amplifiers. Now, with that, that essentially converts this into a separate system. You simply put the mini DSP in between the, uh, the pre-out and the input of the amplifier of the power amplifier, and then you know your second output is volume controlled by this. But again, this has restrictions just like um, you know a home theater receiver. A home theater receiver has pre-outs or subwoofer outs. It's the same thing, um, and no main in unless you're running a separate system in a home theater situation. Uh, it's exactly the same thing. You will only be able to equalize the subwoofers or whatever you want to drive off of the pre-out. But yeah, the Primary still allows you some flexibility, but again, you are limited to only EQing whatever comes out of this pre-out. So the last input on the Mini DSP we're going to be talking about are the digital inputs. Now my Mini DSP 4x2 HD has two digital inputs, a USB audio stream and a uh, Toslink SPDIF input. The things you can do with these inputs uh, are relatively flexible. If you are um, using a fixed line level source into the input, you have two options. You can either use the Mini DSP as a DAC, and therefore the, there's no volume control inside the Mini DSP, so the, all the outputs on it are going to be line level. Or you can use the Mini DSP as a uh, digital preamp, and the outputs on it will be variable. Now, a digital preamp makes sense is if, is if you are outputting to a power amp, or subwoofers, or multiple power amps, as a Mini DSP will be used as a preamp. 
uh, a reason we'd want to use line source is if you are outputting to an integrated amplifier or amplifiers that have their own volume control. Now keep in mind, if you are outputting to an integrated amp from a line level source, um, the integrated amplifier, which comes after the mini DSP, will be controlling the volume. So the other outputs will not, the volume will not be adjusted on those outputs uh, relative to the volume knob on the integrated. So those outputs will stay fixed. Now the other option is to run a variable uh, uh, level input into these digital inputs. Therefore making, for example, the computer that delivers the USB or Toslink signal or like a Chromecast audio that delivers the uh, Toslink signal or a, a streamer box. If you use volume control on those devices, then it essentially works identical to whether if, it essentially works the same as if you used volume control in the mini DSP to use it as a digital preamp all the same applications occur. So now you might be wondering, okay, so you use an Emotiv XDA2 as your DAC preamp, um, and you send that in through the analog outputs, analog inputs into your mini DSP, which then does a uh, analog to digital to analog conversion, and then sends it out to your power amp and your, um, and your subwoofers. So you might say, okay, why don't you just connect your USB to the USB input of the um, mini DSP, and then connect the, uh, directly to the amplifiers and use the mini DSP as a preamp. Now I can definitely do this, but the downsides are that the mini DSP 2x4 HD, unlike the earlier 2x4, doesn't have a three pin header for a volume potentiometer. So the only way to control volume is in software or using a, a remote control. And I also like to have um, the ability to use a coaxial input from, for example, a CD player. And lastly, I like to have a readout of or some sort of visual sign of what the volume is before I start playing music. So these are the digital inputs of the Mini DSP. Some other Mini DSP products like the 4x10 have uh, AES, which is essentially a balanced version of coaxial and coaxial inputs as well. And uh, as far as I know, the Mini DSP 2x4 HD is the only product that actually has a USB audio stream input. Everything else is, uh, is only uh, coaxial or AES or optical inputs. Now keep in mind that if you have another type of Mini DSP and you'd like to use a USB input, um, adapters, Mini DSP actually sells one that converts USB to coaxial, they're very cheap. They range from $30 to you know, $4,000. But again, the, uh, the diminishing returns are quite high. So a $40 adapter will be fine for most applications. You might want to look at my, my favorite one is the Gustard U12, which is a, a great adapter. And that'll work wonderfully. That's like 140 bucks. Now in this section, I'm going to be talking about specifically what I use the mini DSP to do in my system. Now my system, is going to be, the way I have it set up right now, is going to be how a lot of people are going to use it. Um, I, right now, am doing EQ. Now these top cables, these, these are nice ones, these interconnects, are going to the power amp, which th these are my speakers, right? And these white ones are going to my subwoofers, so these are my subs. Now, what I am doing with this, essentially, is I am sending my, uh, I am doing EQ for my speakers, and what's called a high pass. Now a high pass crossover, I went over this in my last mini DSP video, but a high pass means it's allowing higher frequencies to pass and it's cutting off lower frequencies. So I have my high pass set to 70 Hertz. Now that is the crossover point. A crossover is a combination of a high pass and a low pass. The crossover point of my system is 70 Hertz. That means that my speakers will start to roll off artificially created by the mini DSP at 70 Hertz and my subs will start to roll off above 70 hertz uh, in, in a curve. It's called a, uh, a slope, okay? So I have a 24 decibel per octave slope. So one octave past 70 hertz, I am at negative 24 d, um, dB compared to what I was before the crossover point. Now a crossover, the reason I want to do a high pass is because I want to take load off of the speakers. So when I have a woofer, a, a subwoofer cone, and a speaker cone, right? And they're both playing bass frequencies. They're, they're both going to be flapping around, right? So when I take load off of the speaker, that only the subwoofer is going to be playing the bass frequencies, and the high frequencies are, 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 are the higher frequencies are going to be played by the speaker, but no bass frequencies uh, below the crossover point are going to be played by the speaker as loud. Okay. So uh, a subwoofer has essentially the same thing called a low pass. It's just the opposite. It allows low frequencies to pass and then rolls off um, the higher up you go. So I have my low pass uh, on my sub, I mean, subwoofer set to 70 hertz. And what that essentially allows 
is so the subwoofer doesn't play too high. Essentially, the subwoofer isn't designed to play high, so it doesn't sound good. So you want to cut it off before it starts sounding bad. Now that's what a crossover is. I have a what's called a two-way, because there's two components involved, the speaker and a subwoofer, crossover uh, that's, that's done digitally in the Mini DSP. Um, now another reason why you want to do a crossover is something called phase, right? So a phase is essentially, if you have a waveform, I'll draw it on the table, I don't know if you can see it. If you have a wave that's like this, right? Where the peak is, where the peak of one of those waves are, that's in phase. So if, if you have two signals playing and they both happen to have the peak at exactly the same point, that's in phase. Now out of phase is when you have one peak and one dip. So it'll, the out of phase signal will be like, like that. It'll be exactly the opposite and these cancel out perfectly. They perfectly cancel. Now that's very bad and in a speaker all the uh, components in the crossover of the speaker cause some amount of phase shift. Like a capacitor in a speaker crossover causes 90 degrees of phase shift. Now when you have phase shift, uh, you're going to be losing output, you're going to be losing efficiency, you're going to have extra energy that you are losing. So you just get a bunch of losses pretty much. Now speakers and subwoofers will automatically not be in phase because of the speaker crossover. So you'll, the subwoofer cone might come out early and then the speaker cone will follow and then the subwoofer cone will be in. So there'll be a delay essentially. Now having a crossover means that the speaker doesn't play the subwoofer tones and the subwoofer doesn't play the speaker cones. So it's impossible to have them be out of phase anywhere except in the near vicinity of the uh, crossover point. So you basically lose all bad out of phase effects. Now you still want your speakers and subwoofers to be in phase and that's something I will cover. Uh, it's very easy to measure this with a ruler and then do a calculation. I'll explain that. Um, and once you get them in phase then you'll have really good, really tight, perfect bass. But crossing your uh, speakers and subs over in a two-way crossover will certainly eliminate a lot of the phasing issues you will have. So that's enough about crossovers, let's talk about EQ. EQ is essentially finding the areas in which your speaker don't perform very well. So if you have a spike somewhere, EQ will uh, find the spike. And we're going to talk about this using a software called Room EQ Wizard. And it will essentially create a negative spike that's equal amplitude and equal frequency. Uh, so it's an equal and opposite uh, reaction, essentially. And that creates a perfectly flat point right there. So it'll do this with peaks and dips. Dips a little bit less so, because with a dip, again, you need to have a, you need to create a spike, and that creates a lot of extra power that the amplifier will have to send during that spike. So dips are harder to tame, but peaks are very easy to tame. So that's what we're gonna be talking about. And again, EQ just helps your speaker become flatter. There are a lot of poorly engineered speakers out there. A lot of the new B&W stuff is pretty questionable. Uh, Zoo audio is, you know, it's pretty much a joke. And then like speakers like the Auditorium uh, 23 Homage Cinema speaker. I mean, like, what is this? The, so in some cases, and now the Auditorium is an extreme case, and Zoo is obviously extreme. Uh, a lot of cases with like B&W, where you have the B&W 10K spike, which is known, uh, DSP can eliminate it uh, completely. It'll completely eliminate the spike, and that makes a much more pleasing listening experience. So uh, EQ is a great thing and we're going to be talking about how you EQ, how you measure, how you use Room EQ Wizard. Uh, so yeah, just get ready for this. So that's essentially how I'm using the Mini DSP in my system in a separate system. EQ, crossover, timing. Those three features combine to, uh, uh, to DSP my system to a uh, flat response. So the next step in our DSP process is measurement. Measurement is using a measurement microphone to measure the frequency response and other characteristics of your speakers. To do this, we are going to need a measurement microphone, a computer, and freeware software called Room EQ Wizard. I'm going to be talking about this now and teaching you how to measure specifically. There's two different types of measurements mainly. There's anechoic measurements and there's in-room measurements. Anechoic measurements means that the speaker is placed in a situation where there are no echoes or reflections anywhere around the speaker. So what you're getting is exactly direct sound coming off of the speaker. No bass modes, no room modes, nothing. Just the sound that's coming out of the speaker. Now you can do this by bringing your speaker to an anechoic chamber. 
um, which you probably won't be able to do unless you happen to work in a university that has one or know people that work in a university that has one. Um, so you have a couple other options. Your first option is to take the speaker outside and uh, move it away from walls and fences and boundaries as far away as you can and measure the speaker outside. Uh, this is going to give you a pretty good anechoic response. The second option is to do what's called a close range gated measurement. This is where you put your speaker into a room and you take close range measurements of the drivers. Then what you do is you call it's called gating those measurements, which means that you uh, take a look at the impulse response of the speaker and say, okay, I can see that this is the main impulse response and the farther down is a reflection. So you cut off the impulse response before the reflection happens. Now this gets rid of a lot of the jaggedness in your curve and you're going to get an almost perfectly anechoic measurement. And then there's in-room measurements. In-room measurements is taking a measurement at the listening position where your head is in 3D space. What you do is you take the microphone, put it on a tripod at your listening position, right where your head is, and then point it at one of the speakers, take a measurement, and then you'd EQ, DSP, whatever you want to that. You do the same thing with the other speaker, and if you have subwoofers, you do exactly the same thing, but just the subs. Now what this allows you to do is it allows you to create whatever response you want at the listening position, and it also allows you to tackle room modes, which causes peaks and dips in the bass. Uh, the advantages of using an in-room measurement over a loudspeaker or close range or anechoic measurement is that you know exactly what the frequency response is going to be at the listening position. Uh, this allows you to compensate for room effects like bass nodes and uh, certain reflections and floor bounce. Overall, if you want to EQ your loudspeaker so that it sounds best, in-room uh, listening position measurements are the way to go. If you just want to learn how your speaker performs in an anechoic uh, chamber, so this is useful to compare against other frequency responses of uh, other speakers, you definitely want to do a close range gated or an anechoic, a quasi-anechoic measurement. So let's talk about microphones really quick. This is the Mini DSP U Mic One. It's seventy-five dollars from Mini DSP. It comes with the microphone, a, a wind uh, tip, and a, a USB cable and a stand. Now the mount that it comes with is threaded in three eighths inch uh, thread. Now this is uh, okay. You can mount this to tripods that have a removable head. You just have to remove the head first, or you can uh, buy a, a cheap 3 8 inch to a quarter inch adapter, which allows you to mount it on any tripod. I have one in here. Um, and this allows you to mount it on any tripod. It's very easy. Other companies like Dayton and um, uh, Behringer also make measurement microphones, um, but the U-Mic one is good in that it's USB, so it's compatible with all computers, and it comes with a calibration file. Uh, I think the Dayton one also comes with a calibration file, but this one is a... Uh, is a USB microphone, so you don't need to have an audio interface like some of the Dayton and Behringer mics. It's also relatively cheap in comparison. Okay, so now we are um, doing our listening position measurements. I'm gonna put a picture up of how my microphone is placed. It's placed directly where my head is in 3D space at the listening position, and it is pointed perfectly at the midpoint between the tweeter and the woofer of my speaker, and it is uh, oriented horizontally, so it's directly in the center of my speaker. Now, these are all very important, and microphone positioning is extremely important. Now, I've also included pictures of what the uh, view of the microphone looks like from my speaker, and you can see that you can't even see the size of the mic because it's perfectly uh, level to the point where I took the picture, which is the center point between the tweeter and the woofer. So I have it perfectly dialed in right to my speaker. Now, essentially measuring the... Uh, our full range speaker is essentially the same thing um, as measuring the, the close range measurements, except it's farther away and we're measuring the full speaker instead of the tweeter and the woofer. So what you're going to want to do first is going to want to go to the mini DSP application, make sure that you are connected to the DSP. You're going to want to select a profile or a configuration that has no adjustments made to it. So no EQ, no crossover, nothing. Now you can see here that I have everything muted except my left speaker because that's the speaker I'm going to be measuring. Um, and I don't want anything else playing to disrupt the measurements. So first I'm going to, oh, now that I know that, I'm going to open up RoomEQ Wizard. Now RoomEQ Wizard is a free software um, that you can get online. And as you can see here, okay, so I have my mini DSP U-Mic 1 detected. I would like to use it for measurement. Now what this means is that my U-Mic 1, which is connected over USB, RoomEQ Wizard will detect it. And now it says, do you have a calibration file for the mini DSP U-Mic 1? I do. 
Now, a calibration file is what Mini DSP and what Dayton and you know a couple other manufacturers that make measurement mics provide to make sure that the microphone measures perfectly flat. So I'm going to click yes, and now I'm going to go select the calibration file, which is this calibration file right here. See where it says 90 degree? This is used when you are um, measuring a multi-channel system. So when you have like a surround, uh, you'd point the microphone at the ceiling and use this 90 degree file, which is a uh, different as you can see. But no, I'm not. I'm pointing it right at the speaker. So I'm going to use the standard calibration file. So now I'm going to go to the preferences of Fermi Wizard, And as you can see, my input device is, you know, the mic one and my out output device is the default. Uh, my mic meter, as you can see, the calibration file is loaded. So as I was saying, Rumi Q Wizard is a free software that you can download off the internet. I will link the link in the description, and it's where we're going to be doing the vast majority of our work today. So the first thing we're going to do is make sure the calibration file is loaded, and we need to find uh, to make sure that our our level is correct. So we're going to be using pink noise to test the level of our speaker versus the tone. And we're going to be using full range pink noise, um, and our remember our, in our mini DSP utility, our subwoofers are turned off, and we're only measuring one speaker. Okay. So let's go back to where it says this, and we can start playing some of this pink noise. Now keep in mind, at this distance, it's going to get pretty loud. Um, it's going to get very loud, in fact. So the next step is we're going to take a measurement. And again, our measurement's going to be exactly the same thing, 10 to 20,000 hertz. And this time, we are going to leave the room. So I'm going to give myself a 10-second delay um, so I can leave the room in time. Um, the length is going to be exactly the same thing. So I'm about to um, click Start Measuring, and then I'm going to leave the room. The measurement is going to take place. I'm going to come back, and then we can take a look at the measurement, talk about EQ, that kind of stuff. All right, so let me click Start Measurement, and then I'll leave. So now we can see we have a measurement on our hands. This is an in-room measurement, um, and you can see it's, it's pretty bad looking, honestly. So what we first have to do is apply smoothing. I like to apply 1 24th smoothing. So now we can see our measurement. It's pretty bad. Um, there's a lot of jaggedness. There's a lot of uh, really horrible stuff going on here. We have a massive dip at 175 hertz. We have a huge spike at 83 hertz. We have some more spikes along this response. So essentially what we're going to want to do is EQ the speaker to be as flat as possible. So we're going to go to our EQ panel. Um, where it's, So this is our measurement here. We're going to choose, make sure mini DSP, our mini DSP uh, is selected. And then we need to choose a good target level. So the target level is essentially where we, where the target for our, uh, our response is going to be. And now many people have arguments on whether this target should be set low, should be set in the middle, should be set high. But overall, the general consensus is somewhere from low-ish to middle. Now, the reason you don't want to go too low is you might be thinking, okay, well, if I set it, you know, down to the, you know, bottoms of my dips, what is that going to do? This is going to create incredibly sharp filters, which can ring. Um, and whether this is going to be audible to you is, you know, that's up to your ear. But the fact of the matter is these can ring. So what you're going to want to do is you want to choose a point on your graph where you feel that the boost, which we will talk about that later, where it says individual max boost, can still take care of dips. But we don't want it to be so low that we're going to start to allow dips to uh, continue to take place, okay? So uh, I think 70, I think for this measurement, a, a 71.5 will be fine. So let's uh, let's see how this works, okay? Again, we want no crossovers. The speaker type is a, is a full, it's a full range speaker. And again, we want no no base roll off at all, okay? So let's match response to target. Okay, so as you can see, this is um, this is significantly flatter than our other uh, thing. We, we took a lot of this treble boost. We were able to, uh, to cut a little bit of the peaks here. We were able to cut that massive uh, 60 hertz peak, this peak at 118, this peak at 395, this peak at 400. Um, and a lot of these peaks were able to be cut, and that's very, very good. Now, the biggest issue we have here is we can see that there's these dips. This dip here, this dip here, this dip here, this dip here. Now, these are all room modes, right? So these are when the, re when the frequency is, is uh, traveling across the distance of the room, and it cancels out because it's out of phase. 
Now, there's nothing you can do about these unless you really want to eat in a headroom on your amp, and believe me, you won't be able to, you know, uh, have, you know, 20 something dB of headroom available on your amp to correct a 100 hertz uh, dip. It's not going to happen. But what you will be able to do is if you purchase room treatment and bass traps, you can help to uh, get rid of these room modes. And also, placement is huge effect on room modes. So, uh, correct placement of your speakers can, you know, go a very, very long way. So now that we have this uh, relatively flat measurement here, we can take a look at the filters. All right, the good thing about these filters here is that they aren't too sharp. Okay, so that's going to prevent a lot of ringing. They are still relatively sharp, but they're not insanely sharp. So what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to export these coefficient, save filter coefficients to file. Okay, and we are going to, uh, I'll save this to somewhere on my computer that works well. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to go to where it says mini DSP, to our left speaker. We're going to click on PEQ, and then we're going to import this file that I had here. Um, so I can go to my uh, downloads where I had it and open up uh, video left. Okay, so this is essentially what our, uh, our EQ uh, looks like. All right, so we have some dips. We have some dips here. This is what our EQ profile looks like. So now what we can do is we can make another measurement to see how these effects translated in real life. So again, the same exact thing, um, and you know, I can leave the room if I want to make this measurement. But again, this measurement is not for EQ purposes, it's just to see whether it worked. So leaving the room is not nearly as important on this. Awesome, so now that we have that graph, we're going to apply 124th smoothing, and we can already see that this chart is significantly smoother than the other chart. It's still not like insanely smooth, but it's still significantly smoother, okay? So now what we're going to do is we have to measure subwoofers. Now measuring your subwoofer is relatively easy. Um, you just simply turn this off, turn on the subwoofer that you want to measure, and make sure that there's no EQ or anything there. And what we're going to do is we're going to go to our SPL meter, our generator, use a sub-calibration level, and we're going to do the exact same thing. We're going to find a spot where our uh, speaker, um, where our subwoofer plays at 75 dB. Perfect. Okay, for a subwoofer measurement, we're going to be doing essentially the same thing, except our end frequency is going to be 20, I mean 200 hertz, instead of 20,000, because we do not need a... 20,000 hertz subwoofer. Our subwoofer is not going to be playing past 135 because that's the maximum crossover I've set to. So again, we're not going to be using acoustic timing reference because we're not going to be able to hear that on the subwoofer. And I'm going to leave, click this button and then leave the room. All right. Okay, so let's look at these results from our subwoofer. Now our subwoofer managed a uh, response of this. Now this is very correctable, and especially because I had to lower the volume quite a bit, we have plenty of headroom on this subwoofer, and we don't have to worry about ringing because of sharp filters. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to expand this to the uh, 10 to 200, and uh, I think a uh, 66 dB target is appropriate for this subwoofer. So now we need to EQ. Let's, now you can see that our subwoofer graph is here, okay? I'm going to make sure Mini DSP 2x4 HD is selected. And then we need to find a good target, okay? So I set my target already to 65.7, because that's the bottom of one of these dips, and that'll allow us to get the best response. Again, we're not really getting much usable response below that. So actually, I'm, gonna, I'm going to set my response to around 68.1. This will give us a little bit more headroom, and because we're not going to get any real-world response below you know, uh, 23 hertz, that's where my subwoofer start to roll off, then uh, we, we don't waste headroom, okay? So let's, measure, let's correct from... Uh, 20 hertz to, uh, or actually let's correct from 23 hertz to 200. Or actually, let's correct from 23 hertz to 130, 135. Okay, now we're going to match response to target. Okay, so now you can see that this frequency response for our subwoofer is incredibly flat. Um, compared to our old frequency response, which was quite a bit uh, more bumpy. And we were able to cut a little bit out of that dip there, um, but that's really, you know, nothing insane. Again, this is a very respectable subwoofer frequency response, 
And um, you know, if we set the target a little lower, we can experiment with this. Again, this is something you, you, you have to experiment with. You can set the target a little lower to 66.4 decibels. You can do the same correction, and this should get us even flatter. Okay, so as you can see now, this is a very, very flat frequency response. And um, again, we don't need anything below 20 hertz, so just forget about that. But this is an extremely flat frequency response for our subwoofers. And even though you have this dip at 80 hertz, that's not really something we can EQ out. This is something that's just a room mode. All right, so now what we're going to do is we can uh, export these safe fil filter coefficients to file. We can call this a video sub. Okay, and then what we're going to want to do is we're going to go to uh, our mini DSP, sub left, and insert our parametric EQ here. Now you can see this is where our uh, EQ happened, okay? It's pretty good. So now what we do is we can exit out of this, unmute both of these, and the next step is to measure both of these speakers. We're going to go to SPL meter and generator. We're going to do a full range speaker calibration, and... Uh, Let's uh, adjust this to 75 hertz. We need to insert a crossover point between these two speakers. Now, this is very easy to do, and the Mini DSP allows you to have some pretty insane crossover settings. So a crossover on a subwoofer should be a, a low-pass crossover. Now, low-pass means, as I said, it's passing low frequencies. Now, 70 hertz at a linkwitz riley 24 dB per octave. Now, 24 dB per octave means every octave you go past the crossover point, you're going to be 24 decibels down. So when we look at uh, right here, okay, so 138 hertz, so essentially 140 hertz, you're going to be at negative 24 dB. Now, 70 is a good spot um, because, as I explained, it's where both of the uh, speakers are at the same level. And again, what we want to do is, we, is you can look through this. There's a ton of different options. You have Butterworth, you have Linkwitz Riley, um, you have uh, a Vessel crossover. So there's tons of things to play with. When you're more experienced. You can play around with these, see what sounds best. And again, crossover is mostly done by ear, okay? So you have to make sure that it sounds good to you before you just choose one. Now for the speaker, we're doing the same thing with a high pass. Now I've also chosen a, uh, a 70 hertz, 24 decibel per octave high pass. And you can see that um, at 70 hertz, or it doesn't let you see 70, but 71, you're both at negative 6 dB. And this will equalize to a 0 dB point. All right, so let's take a measurement of this, and I will exit the room. I'll give myself a five second delay, and I will exit the room. Awesome. So this is our measurement for our, uh, our system, and I'm going to apply 124th smoothing. Now the big thing that should stick out to you from this measurement is that we have a massive, our subwoofers are incredibly loud in comparison to our speakers. Now let's say our speaker average is around 70 decibels, right? And our subwoofer average is around 76 decibels. So what we have to do is we have to uh, use our levels to lower the subwoofer volume to match the speaker volume. So again, this is uh, 70, and this is 76, or 77, okay? So essentially the difference is 70, uh, or 7 decibels, okay? So what we have to do is we have to go to our subwoofer, and we're going to add a negative 7 uh, level, okay? So what this will do is this will make our speakers and our subwoofers perfectly flat. So let's uh, take another measurement with this and see how it is. Again, I'm leaving the room, I'm having a delay. Awesome. So as you can see from this graph, um, our, our high frequency stayed ex within you know, the margin of error, and our subwoofer level came down a lot. So as you can see, this graph is essentially perfectly flat. Our average subwoofer is within a decibel of our speakers. Now I do want to point out that most people prefer an elevated bass response, right? So the way you do this is you just simply not put negative 7, you put something like negative 5. Now what this would do is give you a 3 decibel boost to your bass. Now most people prefer this sound, um, and it's uh, you know in the Harman test, I'll link to the Harman tests, but this is a preferred sound signature, it's a slight bass boost. 
So that's what you'd be able to do. So overall, let's take a look at what we've been able to accomplish. We were able to cut this massive spike here, and we were able to overall flatten and smooth our frequency response to an acceptable level. Now keep in mind, because this is an untreated room, my response is going to be a little more jagged than uh, a treated room. All of these dips here, all of these dips and all of these spikes are not a result of my speaker. They're actually a result of room modes in my room. So resonances and et cetera, okay? So this spike here wouldn't actually be here in an anechoic chamber. Now, the, uh, the only way you can solve this is with bass traps and room treatment. And I will link to a couple ways you can build your own bass traps or you can buy pre-built ones and et cetera. Okay. Now, because I did all these measurements relatively quickly, and I, you know, my mic positioning might have not been perfect, etc., some of my old measurements were actually a little bit better. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open those so you can see um, essentially what I what I did. This is essentially what my left speaker looked like before I even inserted DSP into the system. All right. So there's no DSP correction here. Now let's take a look at what my left system sounded like after DSP, all right? So as you can see, I lost headroom. I lost quite a bit of headroom. Uh, as you can see, there's a difference of approximately 74 to 67. So I lost around five decibels of headroom. But I was able to get a very, very smooth and very respectable frequency response for my system and for having an untreated room. This is very respectable. There's nothing wrong with this response, okay? So this is my um, average response for my two speakers after correction. And this is really impressive, honestly. My right speaker doesn't have quite as big of a dip here. So this is my average response. And you can see my microphone is wildly inaccurate under, um, I actually have to go out. My microphone is, is incredibly inaccurate under 20 hertz. So as you can see, that's why you have a rising response. But overall, this is the average before correction, and this is the average after correction. A pretty drastic difference, and this is definitely, definitely audible. Now, um, so this is essentially showcasing what I can do with DSP. I was able to correct my speaker's response, I was able to correct my subwoofer's response, I was able to create a crossover between them, and I was able to level match them perfectly. Um, and that is really what DSP is all about, creating the smoothest frequency response for your speakers. And now that I've been able to teach you this, you can go out and, um, you know, uh, be able to do this yourself. And keep in mind, I also want to point out something really important. Room EQ Wizard allows you to do all this correction with an application called EQ or Equalizer APO. Now, Equalizer APO is a Windows application. I think there's a, a Mac equivalent. And um, it essentially works as a mini DSP, but without the crossover in timing uh, in certain timing uh, portions. Now, what it will allow you to do is, is EQ your speakers without having a mini DSP in the system. So if your only source is your computer, um, then this is a great option. You don't have to buy a mini DSP, and Room EQ Wizard works exactly the same. The only difference, by the way, for Equalizer APO is that when we went to EQ, you do not send filters settings to Equalizer. You um, export filter settings as text. And you also want to make sure that your... Um, Selection is generic and not mini DSP, so make sure it's set to generic, okay? So now that you've been able to do that, um, now that I've taught you how to do DSP, we can talk about um, timing and measuring your timing and getting everything in phase. That's the next section. So thank you for staying through this, you know, super long tutorial on Groomy Q Wizard, and uh, I hope you learned a lot. Timing is a very important thing to adjust in your mini DSP settings. The timing between your subwoofer and your speakers or your speaker drivers to each other is very crucial to having a um, good sound stage and good imaging. Today I'm going to be talking about how to do physical time alignment for subwoofers and speakers and how to do uh, time alignment between uh, drivers in a speaker. Doing physical time alignment is very easy. All you need is a tape measure and um, someone to hold the tape measure on the other side or you can just try to get it to balance if it's not too far. All you need to do is uh, take the tape measure, put it on the subwoofer cone, and measure to the listening uh, position, all right? Now, I would actually like put something at the listening position that you can reference it to because you need to have a very precise measurement. Then what you do 
is you take the measurement uh, exactly the same one, except do it with the midpoint of the speaker. So once you take the measurement of the speaker to the listing position and the subwoofer to the listing position, you're going to want to find the difference, and you're gonna wanna plug the difference into the equation I have here. And that's going to spit out a number in milliseconds um, that you need to adjust for. So for example, if your subwoofer is 70 inches away and your speaker is uh, 80 inches away, right? and the millisecond that you need to justify is two inches. This is something I just made up. I mean, two milliseconds, okay? And the milliseconds you need to justify is uh, two milliseconds. Then what you're gonna wanna do is add two milliseconds of delay to the subwoofer because it's closer. Now, if this was the other way around and your speakers were 70 uh, inches and your subwoofers were 80 inches and the same delay was just two milliseconds, you're gonna wanna add the delay to the speakers uh, because that'll time align them. This is the way to physically time align your speakers, but make sure you are also using your ear. Um, clicking, f going on mini DSP's uh, settings and holding down the delay button in the positive and negative directions can really help to find the spot uh, audibly where the speakers seem to be in phase. Just listen to a song with a lot of uh, kick drums in it and a lot of low frequency content and try to uh, figure out where it sounds best. This is a very easy thing to do. It just takes a little bit of time. Finding the delay between uh, two drivers is a little more difficult. So essentially, uh, one, your woofer, your low frequency driver, needs to play relatively high, um, high enough, you know, at least into at least have a usable response from like the three to six kilohertz range. If it can't do that, then it'll be very difficult to have this work. You're going to need to have an acoustic timing. Uh, you're going to need to take a measurement of both drivers individually. And remember when I was talking about that acoustic timing reference, you're gonna need one of those. Then it'll show you um, in the menu, I'll put up a screenshot, the difference from the acoustical uh, timing point. And uh, Mini DSP has a great article on this. And then what you can do is figure out the difference there. And in milliseconds, it'll actually show you, you subtract them from each other and add the delay to the channel then that'll perfectly time align the drivers on your speakers. It's actually a, a pretty easy way to do it, and especially if you are uh, doing using a mini DSP to do actual crossovers for your speakers, this is a great way to do it. Keep in mind that you can't do this if your speakers have a crossover built in and you aren't using bi-wire terminals. If you have two stereo amps and your speakers have bi-amp terminals uh, and you, you know, have extra channels on your mini DSP, go ahead and try this. It'll completely work, but the easiest way to do this is if you rip the crossovers out of your speakers, but that's for a different video. I'm going to have a video on that later. Overall, I have covered essentially everything you need to know um, about setting up and using the mini DSP. Uh, I've talked about EQ. I've talked about subwoofer EQ. I've talked about uh, timing. I've talked about crossovers, basically everything you need to know to get started. If you have any questions, please comment them below and I will answer them as fast as I possibly can. And also uh, feel free to head over to a Reddit audio file. I have a link in the description to the actual post where I posted this video and feel free to ask questions there as well. I'm more active there than I am on YouTube. So thank you so much for watching this video. I really appreciate it. It's probably been a pretty long uh, video and uh, make sure that if you are, you know, if, if you just got a DSP and you want to get it set up, if you're looking to purchase a DSP, if you just want to learn more about the information, I appreciate you watching this video and uh, happy listening.